I want to grab this passage of scripture that we're going to do today. But uh, I want to focus the, our attention. We're going to read from Acts chapter 2, uh, which is the first time the New Testament church has a chance under the power of the Holy Spirit to share the good news. And uh, so we're going to read this passage. Um, but uh, just this is, um, this is an example of um, what you'll find in this booklet. You can see there, there's the, the multiple readings that you can do individually. And the bold one is the one that you would do, a suggested reading that you do together as a group. So um, you could do it personally, but then you could do it as a group together. But here's something I want to, to just remind you about in terms of you and I. Uh, yesterday at the wedding, one of the, the beautiful things is that it was a retelling of stories. What I was and what I am. Our BC and our AD story. Before Jesus and after I discovered Jesus, after Jesus discovered me. And so my story before Jesus is, is that uh, whether you feel like it or not, we were living in darkness, we were lost and we we're ruling ourselves. And that's, that's the story of every person in this room who, is, who considers themselves to be Jesus. We had a story without Jesus. And then we have a story with Jesus. And the Jesus is now part of my story. Jesus comes into my story and he becomes the center of my story. And he changes my story. I am forever changed. Uh, I, the reality for all of us who believed in Jesus is that something, uh, we were dead in our sins. I had a body, I had a soul. But my spirit was not alive. But when I asked God to forgive me for my sins and believed in the Lord Jesus, his death and his resurrection, he came into me and he made me, gave me a new alive spirit. And I became an eternally alive person. Something that I wasn't before. So what we're talking about today is the good news that we believe is the good news that changes people's lives and their story. Do you believe that? Yes. Just waiting. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. Well, let's read a story about... And we're going to look at this story through the eyes of one person, uh, particularly Peter. Um, you probably haven't read this story through the eyes of Peter, but I want you to get it uh, through the eyes of Peter. Um, so... Uh, in, um, in Luke 24, Jesus is appearing to the disciples just before he goes back to, to heaven. And this is what he says. It was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And he goes, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You, who's he talking to? To these disciples, you are all witnesses of all these things. What things? Life, death and resurrection. But something more than that. So they were witnesses, yes, they saw him die. Some of them witnessed his resurrection at the tomb, but then he appeared before others over a period of 40 days. They witnessed that. But there's something more that they were witnesses of. Because what is a witness? Now, this is a, a legal term. It is someone that can give ev evidence in a court of law, and usually it has to be more than one. To, for something to be true, it has to be proven by the same Number of witnesses, and these are all witnesses. You are witness of all these things. What's all the things include? Everything he did, yes. Holy Spirit coming, yes. But it's coming yet. When he said this, it hasn't yet happened. There's something we're missing here. Transformation of other people's lives. He go. The message will be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. That whose name? 
Jesus Christ. Beginning in Jerusalem. And what was the message? There is forgiveness for sins for all who... You are witnesses of all these things. That little line there from Luke chapter 24, verse 46 to 47, is a really sharp, short, good news that we believe. Would you agree with that? In the mouth of Jesus, to them. Okay. Now, this is what he says to them. Now, I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. And that's the next slide is bounces to Acts chapter 2. But before we go to Acts chapter 2, I want you to think about what Peter was thinking when Jesus said that. Um, we know in John chapter 20 that Jesus comes to Peter and what had Peter done 50 days before? He denied him. He'd had an epic fail. Uh, the epic fail was, Lord, I will, though everybody else leave you, I will never forsake you. And then Jesus goes, yeah, before the cock crows thrice, three times, you're going to deny me. It's kind of like, oh, come on, Jesus. <laughs> Let me fight him. And sure enough, Jesus is getting tried and Peter denies Jesus three times. And then in John chapter 20, after Jesus has appeared to them and he's shared with them from the Old Testament, or what they called the Bible at that time, how what would happen to Messiah, that he would die, that he would rise from the dead and that there would be forgiveness of sins for all who repent. So Jesus went over that and over that and over that for 40 days. This is the last time he said it. We know that Jesus spent time unpacking the Old Testament. Do you know why he spent 40 days doing that? Why didn't he do it before? You know what? They wouldn't believe him when he said, the, Messiah, the Son of Man has to die but in three days rise again. They just couldn't get that. So Jesus went, yeah, I'm going to have to wait. <laughs> Anybody here in the room ever feel like you don't know what you're doing? Yes. Probably because you, God's going, yeah, I'm just going to have to wait. <laughs> They're thick. <laughs> if I told them now, they just won't believe you. You know, it's just like Jesus, there's so many things Jesus would have liked to say. They just couldn't get their heads around it. And so Jesus, in that 40 days, is unpacking the prophets and what Isaiah said and what Joel said. And Peter is, is seeing Jesus appear and listening to Peter. And then in John 20, G Jesus comes to him. They're on the beach, takes him aside and says, Peter, do you love me? And he does this thing three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And in this, every time Jesus is going, it's okay, Peter. Feed my sheep. Look after my sheep. There's this whole thing of restoration. You deny me three times. I'm telling you, I'm giving you a role to look after the sheep. Has anybody ever felt that they've let God down and they've failed God because they haven't done what they should have or they didn't do what they should have done? Or they did something they shouldn't have done and they didn't do what they should have done? Is anybody in the room with me on that? Okay, you are just like Peter. Good news. God used epic fails and epic failures to do his things. So Peter gets restored. He's in the uh, Acts chapter 1. He's in the room and says to everybody, I think we need to appoint another guy to replace Judas. They appoint Matthias. And he is with the other guys. And what is he doing in Acts chapter 1? He is praying with all of them. What's he praying for? The expectation of the Father's promise that was gifted gifted to them that would come that would give them power to be witnesses now guess what peter needed badly because he had failed miserably as a witness for jesus just before he died he he needed the power of the holy spirit because he had been a big mouth and he'd been brave and he he could tell the good news couldn't he 
He knew it all, but he, when, he, when, when push came to shove, Peter failed badly. What he needed, he needed something that he did not have in himself. Can I just say to you, all of us here, we need the Holy Spirit to come upon us and clothe us with power so we can be witnesses to not only the fact that Jesus died for me, he rose again, and so he died for me, he rose again, but he has forgiven me of my sins and he's calling me to repent and turn to him. That's my story. This is what I believe. This is what I've done in response to what I believe. He died, he rose again. And his promise was to all who repent that he would forgive their sins. This is my story. You know, you can tell the good news factually. God did this, God did this, God did this, God did this. And people go, "Uh uh-huh. You know what? When Jesus' story is told through you, it becomes a living story. It's no longer facts. Those, those, Those facts have eternal value and eternal power. But when they are shared through you, the Spirit of God is breathing his words from out of you, what he's done in you. Your testimony, your story is so powerful. So let's read Acts chapter 2. What's happened just before verse 13? For those of you who have read this, you know that they were praying diligently and at 9 o'clock in the morning something happens. Were they expecting it? Were they expecting this, people? What were they doing? They were devoted themselves to prayer. It was Pentecost. It was a season of celebration and they were probably reading the scriptures. There would have been certain scriptures they would have been reading and I don't have time to go into those scriptures today, but they would have been ready and what was going to happen is they knew something was coming. They just didn't know when, but I reckon they had an idea that the season of Pentecost was when God was going to break out and he was going to do something and that's what happened. The Spirit, suddenly, Spirit comes upon them and appears in tongues of fire on their head. They all begin speaking in languages they've never learned, but languages that all the people that were present at the time in Jerusalem, who were pilgrims coming in from all over the known world, they'd come to celebrate Pentecost. And when they heard these guys praising God, they began, that got their notice. And this is what they said. Some of them made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. In the ESV version, it says they've had new wine. Too much new wine. What they were saying is they were... Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Who stood up? The epic fail. The epic fail. By the way, uh, they reckon Peter is about 29. He's the eldest of all the disciples. Do you know when a Jewish man was allowed to preach, to teach and to say things in a synagogue or anywhere? 30. He was underage. Epic fail and underage. An underage preacher is a dangerous thing. But look out when the Spirit comes upon our young and our old. And look what Joel says. Now, I'm going to, I don't know this to be sure. It could have just been spontaneously coming out of Peter from the Spirit of God. That this, he's, what, what I believe probably happened is, is that Jesus, he was. God was bringing back to his mind the things that he had learnt from Jesus. And this is what he said. He raised his voice, addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you living in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and listen carefully to what I am about to say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what... The prophet Joel, I'm going to keep going, said, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. 
Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men (laughs) will see visions. Your old men. I was talking about Peter, not me. (laughs) Your old men will dream dreams. I'm a good dreamer. Even on my servants, both, and the other word for that is slaves. When Paul says, I'm in Romans 1 1, he says, I am a servant. It's the same word, doulos, even on my slaves. Both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke and the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him as yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Can I just just stop there? Get it. God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge was that his beloved son would be handed over, killed for us. It was deliberate. It was a plan and he knew about it well in advance. With the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But, always love the three-letter word, but God... But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here today. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. And seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. Exalted him to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he's poured out what you now see and hear. This is the first time that someone's preached the good news. And he's telling everybody there is eternal life. And this is Jesus is the first one who has got the control of eternal life. And he's shown us what the resurrection from the dead is like. And he's not dead. He's not in the grave. He's alive. For David did not ascend to heaven. And yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore... Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Yahweh. Messiah. Lord Lord is Yahweh and Messiah, King. Yahweh, King. King Yahweh. Everybody knew that. The words that Peter spoke, like this man, and then he combines this man with this Yahweh, King. They knew Jesus was a man. And Peter's telling him for the first time, he's Yahweh and king too. And the crowd, what happened? If I tell you that Jesus is a man and God, it may not cut you to the heart. But when the spirit moves on upon a person and they realize who Jesus is, This is what happens. They were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? How many of here, people in the room, were going on this way in their story, away from God? 
clueless of God, not interested in God. And then somehow someone comes into your story, tells you about what God has done for them. And all of a sudden, your heart is, it's like your heart is, is troubled. Your heart is bouncing out of your chest. You're, you're internally aggravated because you know there's truth in this person's story and you need this truth, but you're fighting the truth. Anybody been there? Anybody remember that feeling? This is what they were going through. They, they heard it and they knew it was true and there was this response that came from their hearts. And let me tell you, this is a work of God in someone's life. Because Peter had preached to the people who nailed him to the cross. He, he, he said, this is on us, all of us. We were there. And this is what Peter's response is to them. Just as Jesus had said about repent, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you, your children, and for all far off, that's us, for all whom the Lord God will call. And then with many other words, he warned them and he pled with them. He said, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And out of those, the big crowd that he preached to, those who accepted his message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. It's a big crowd. How many people didn't accept Jesus? We don't know. We just know that those who accepted him. Here's Peter, the 29-year-old, not quite old enough to be a rabbi, in the temple courts, preaching to a large group of people about Jesus the one he had denied 50 days earlier. And the Spirit's come upon Peter and he has this courage and boldness to, to declare his tr witness, this, his story. This is true. This is what's true. This is what I've seen. This is what he's done for me. And I'm telling you, this is what God wants to do in your life. I, I'm giving you a tool here this morning and the tool is this. But the first tool that every person who is a believer of Jesus needs is the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because there is no power on earth that can share this message in itself, in a human power, no human power. This message has to be shared in the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it will, be, it will have... The, the, the message itself is powerful, so it will have fruit. But let me tell you, you want to see that kind of response? That takes the Spirit of the Lord just filling a person and overflowing him. Who wants to have that kind of flow on their life? I, I want that. But here's, here's the second tool I'm, I'm giving you. There's a simple story of Jesus' life that we just need to tell in our own words. From what you just heard Peter say, not the part about David and all that part but what was the simple message of the good news that we believe could you could you tell somebody because if you're not clear on that you probably won't tell somebody so what were the simple elements of the story that's changed your life because they're there and i reckon it's not that hard to get it and but you just then have to figure out how i tell somebody about that how it changed my life all right so what are the simple elements Let's just work on them as I finish. All right, it starts with, first of all, God came as a man. Peter's message was Jesus of Nazareth, who did many signs and wonders. God came as a man. That's the first thing. That's the first simple point. And then we get to Tim's point. It was a plan that God would send his son to die. And then, two, what's the, what's the point of rising again? What's the big point about that? Defeat sin and death. If, if Jesus died, he's a good man with a good story. If he rose from the dead, then he's a man who is God 
who defeated sin and death through his death and his resurrection. You see, you're not forgiven if he stays dead in the grave. So you're, first of all, Jesus comes as a man. The Father sends him deliberately and he planned it that he would die and that he would rise again with a resurrected body, with a brand new resurrected body, right? But it still has got the scars. But here's the beautiful thing. Well, what was the purpose for that? Forgiveness of our sins. And what do you have to do to receive that? Repent. What does repent mean? I don't, like, like, it's a religious word, right? Uh, well, it's a religious word, it's an old word, and it's not a word commonly known to most people. So how would you express it to someone that you're sharing your story with? I turned from the way I was walking and I turned to God. I, 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 I agreed. I believed. I accepted I needed to be forgiven. And I asked him to forgive me. And I asked him to forgive me for my sins. So what's the story? Jesus came as a man sent by the Father deliberately in order to die and rise again to forgive people for their sins. And if you believe that, what do you do? You say, God, please forgive me. I need forgiveness of sins. Andrew, you're busting to say something. So I'm going to say, take Andrew's comment and say one of the things for he, that he's experienced is that he sees that people need to recognise that they have a sin problem. What's the best way to help people that they've got a, a, to recognise that they have a sin problem? Is it to point out their sin? <laughs> okay, how would you do it? Tell your story of how you... We're living your life and recognise your own need for forgiveness, that you had a problem with sin and you recognised that there was only one person that could deal with your sin and that was Jesus. And you had to humble yourself and ask for forgiveness. Uh, I'm going to have to... No, no, I'm going to have to leave that there, Andrew. I appreciate your comment. I just need to bring this home right now. So... What did you learn about your story and about Jesus' story and how they combine? So you have the simple facts. Jesus came as a man, but he was God, deliberately sent by the Father so that he might die and rise again to forgive people for their sins. And people receive this forgiveness as they turn to him and ask him to forgive their sins. And then you simply ask them, do you believe that? However, in your story, how you might say that, that's the facts, but how I would say it is that I realised who Jesus was. I realised when I learnt that he died and rose again to forgive my sins, that I realised that I had a sin problem and that I needed to be, to be forgiven. And I recognised that he was the only person that could ever forgive me. And I went to him and I acknowledged what I had done in trying to live my life without him and I asked him to forgive me. I asked him to become my friend. I did that when I was eight. That's my story. Do you believe that? Let your story be the way you share the good news with people. Otherwise, what happens is that people can feel you're preaching a message at them. But I can tell you that Peter was preaching what Jesus had told him to that. That was perfect for that audience. In the Holy Spirit, Jesus said he would convict the world of sin, judgment and righteousness. We, we don't convict people of sin. Let him do that. You just tell your story. Let him come upon you 
and let your words come out. Like Andrew just shared this morning, his story, his divine appointment started with a catastrophe. But the catastrophe brought this testimony that said, I believe in miracles. I believe a God that can intervene in human affairs. And I believe that that God cares about your situation right now. And I'm telling you that because I know that from my experience because when I had bone marrow issues, this is what God did in my life. That's your story, right, Andrew? It's how you shared the good news that Jesus is real right now. But when you get to the point in that relationship where people need to know that they need to, that Jesus died and rose again for forgiveness of sins, you can tell them that. But it's because it happened first in you, not because you're preaching at them. You're sharing with them. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. So true. So my, my friends, your story, Jesus' story, this story, and if it happened for you, God can do it for others. So I'm going to get you to stand up. We're going to finish. And I'm going to, to as you um, go and read those passages, there are seven uh, concise, captured stories of retelling of the good news we believe in the key teachings of Jesus in our resources. As you read through that and as you meditate on those stories, what I'm going to pray is, is that God will reignite your first, your first love. The memories that are in you of that knowledge that I have been forgiven. And I have been given new life. And I am right with God. 